um, thank you um, for uh, letting me uh, give the presentation remotely. And um, so my goal is actually to try to see how we can convert into some kind of modeling all this uh, huge knowledge in physiology, which uh, at least for somebody like me uh, from, like from the domain of mathematics and engineering can feel like overwhelming in the sense that there is overwhelming evidence that indeed the eye and the brain are connected, that you know, we can see a lot of things in the eye and that they can be used to know something about the brain. But then how do we do it in practice? So, okay. Uh, so the objective of this eye to brain project is actually to uh, try to find a way to connect the marvelous non-invasive measurements that can be done in the eye that have been explained by Alon um, with what is going on in the brain. And uh, our goal is to try to use mathematics and computational modeling to actually connect the two. So in this talk, and I will try to keep it short, uh, I would like to give you some ideas of the rationale of the modeling, the challenges that we face, the methods that we choose to adopt in order to tackle this uh, huge but compelling problem, and a summary of where we are and the future steps. So I will give you kind of an overview, and actually Christophe and Lorenzo will um, talk more about the details of the ongoing project. So let us begin with the rationale. Okay, so we have uh, non-invasive measurements in the eye with a lot of detail, and we want to know what's going on in the brain. So first of all, uh, it has been our experience uh, with the modeling that we have been doing in the ophthalmology field that uh, a measurement by itself that is performed even in the eye uh, is not really uh, going to give a conclusive um, answer of the status of the patient uh, without taking in consideration other factors specific of the patient. And this is what Alon uh, was uh, discussing about, for example, the role of IOP and blood pressure. Uh, so point number one in the rationale, a measurement by, them, by itself may not be conclusive in, from a clinical perspective. And the second point is that, so we have seen, and I will show you some preliminary re results in the field of, I mean, in the field of ophthalmology, so related to the eye, that indeed using mathematical modeling based on physics, like Along was describing, we can develop some quantitative tools that can help interpret the ocular measurements so that then we can extract from them some biomarkers for conditions uh, specific to the patient in the eye and in the brain. So this is the picture of the eye to brain rationale. So I told you that I would give you an example related to the eye of why this rationale in our opinion is sound. So now imagine that in a patient, uh, one measures uh, what you see in the table. So a uh, certain diameter of arterioles, uh, the blood uh, velocity in the central retinal artery, and uh, a difference in oxygen saturation with, between arteries and veins, as reported in the table. So 135 microns, 10 centimeters per second, and 35%. And you know all about all these measurements and instruments because Alon talked about them. So you know that it is measurable. So then the point is, we have these numbers. And so should these values raise concerns from a clinical viewpoint or not? So how do we know when actually uh, we should raise red flags or, or, or there are no, no flags? So this is what we have been trying to develop our modeling for. Uh, now, for ex in this specific example, by using um, a model similar to that described by Alon, uh, then we could say that actually uh, these numbers uh, are in the kind of uh, normal regime if the patient has a blood pressure of 120 over 80 and intraocular pressure of 15, but actually are on the low side and should rate concern if uh, the blood pressure is higher. And so now this is what uh, we mean by using mathematical modeling to provide some quantitative tools to say, it is true that the measurements that you have are 135, 10, and 35%. However, the values themselves of the measurements can be indicative of a normal situation, the one on the left, or of a uh, 
possibly pathological situation, the one on the right, when you take into account some patient-specific factors that actually can also be measured in the clinic. So this is the way in which we think uh, of modeling as interpreting clinical data. Now, I showed you with a simple example, and we want to take it into the relationship be between the eye and the brain. And as you hear, heard from Alon, there are many, many factors that enter in this relationship. So, uh, and here I listed some, but uh, we heard all the presentation before. So the point, the crucial question is, how can we account for all these factors that may vary among individuals, but that influence the relationship between the eye and the brain? And might also then influence the outcome of our overall uh, connection. Okay, so here I move to the second point that are the modeling challenges. Uh, I am trying to translate uh, what Alon said uh, in a way that we can then uh, uh, start uh, building the model upon. And actually, this is the result of several years of working together, because the idea is not to build a model just for the sake of it, but to build models that make sense and that, and that can actually help in the clinic. So uh, it is natural uh, that uh, we are basically multi-scale systems both in time and in space so let us look on the left uh, indeed uh, our body um, has some uh, features that are actually systemic for example the circulations of fluids uh, which actually need to be taken uh, into account on the scale of the body itself because the uh, circulation uh, kind of compensate from one part to the other but then we go down to the organs themselves, which in particular for the eye and the brain, we are of the order of centimeters. But then what happens in, let's say, what regulates the structure and the function of these organs that also then affect the whole body actually takes place a very, uh, uh, sorry, at much smaller scales, at the scale of, for example, the neurons, uh, and here we are around millimeters, but then down to nanometers, if we think of the ion channels that are across the cellular membranes, where the ion exchange take pla takes place, and that actually dictates how cell resp uh, cells respond to the environment, thereby again dictating the function at the level of the body. Uh, on the right, you see the time scales. Uh, well, it is true that our heartbeat is around the length scale of a second, but it is also true that the reaction and the ion exchanges going on in the cells are much faster. And that is also known that we have some major changes in metabolism and the pressures between the day and the night. This is called circadian rhythm, which has an effect of also on glaucoma and other diseases. But then it is also known that many of the neurodegenerative disorders, for example, are uh, related to age and uh, changes that occur with age, which actually occur on the time scale of years. And these time and length scales are all collected together, uh, which from a mathematical viewpoint and computational viewpoint makes the problem extremely challenging. But if you do, we do not take into account this coupling, then we are losing the physiology and we are using the meaningfulness of the modeling from the clinical perspective. Uh, uh, see, uh, still in the uh, section of challenges, this is truly a multi-domain multi problem in the sense of the biophysics, uh, meaning that both in the eye and in the brain and in the body, we have different kinds of fluids. For example, you see here the blood, the CSF, and, and so on. We have different kinds of solids, like the bones, uh, different tissues in the eye, like the sclera, the cornea, the lamina, as we heard from Alon, and different tissues in the brain, and so on. And then we have several metabolic processes that are occurring at the level of the cells, as you see listed here. And then we have a very important neuronal Signal, signaling that is connecting the various organs together, and in particular the eye and the brain, and it allows us to see and convert the light into actually something that we see. Then uh, we have multiple components also from the mathematical viewpoint, because as uh, we know, uh, for example, even if we decide to model just one thing in this whole picture, like for example, we want to model the blood flow in a vessel, well, we know that we could go with partial differential equations in a deformable domain, uh, or we can go with a simplified approach, ordinary differential equation, or we could consider the stochastic variations of the parameters. And so here we are uh, touching 
very different uh, fields in mathematics, but that may all serve the purpose of modeling what we need. And last but not least, uh, we have different uh, issues also uh, uh, raised in the field of scientific computing, because we need uh, uh, how many methods, I mean, we have all studied uh, that could be applied to uh, model each of these uh, items that I, I've listed here. So the main message of this slide is that each of these boxes could be a discipline by itself. And uh, nobody of us, at least uh, for, for sure not me, we are not uh, uh, expert in everything, but still we might need different expertise to put together to address the main problem, which is try to connect the eye to the brain in a way that will be meaningful to, interp to interpret clinical data and uh, provide a new quantitative, quantitative tool for clinical assessment. So where and how do we start? So <clears throat> I move to the modeling methods. So, and I go back to that slide of the multiple scales. Uh, I start with the time because we kept it simple. So we started looking at what happens on the time scale of a cardiac cycle. Why we did that? Because uh, when um, uh, data are, um, are acquired in a patient during a visit. I mean, it is a one point in time and, and you can see variations, for example, due to the heart pulse. However, it is also true that some diseases, again, like glaucoma or neurodegenerative disorders, uh, progress slowly. And so we should consider also remodeling, which takes uh, place in a much longer time scale, but that will be for later development. So at the moment, we are focusing on one time scale that is the one of the cardiac cycle. Uh, we are putting much more effort uh, in order to take into account the different scales in uh, space. So uh, we have strived to maintain a systemic view, uh, in particular for the fluid circulation and for the mass transport. Uh, and but for that, we have used reduced order modeling, mostly 0D and some part 1D. Uh, and then we used, uh, let's say, we uh, build some zooms uh, so that that could be connected to the systemic view, uh, some zooms that could uh, take into account what happens in the specific uh, regions of interest for the problem attend. In particular, uh, in the eye and in the brain, as sorry, let me focus on the eye for a moment. You saw all the images from Alon, and they give you maps of the retina, the thickness of the different layers in the back of the eye. So the data are by nature 3D, and uh, so if we want to provide tools to interpret this data, we should be able to account for the three-dimensionality of this data also in the modeling. But of course, it is not feasible to maintain this uh, uh, three-dimensionality everywhere. And so we are led to a multi-scale coupling between the systemic view and the special regions of interest. But we should not forget what happens at the scale of the cells, because as we said before, this is where everything is actually uh, happening. And uh, we, have we have started sorry, to tackle this, um, uh, this uh, point too. And uh, how we did it, uh, if I have time, I will show you an example. It is uh, through what we can call multi-scale effective coupling, where some of the parameters of the systemic uh, view and the special region zooms are actually the result of an upscaling from what happens at the lower scale. Uh, so then the current stage, let me go back to this uh, picture and let me update you on where we are. So for the systemic view, our group has developed many different models uh, um, to, um, to grasp and to describe the main features of the blood flow in different vascular beds in the eye, like the retina, the choroid, the ciliary body, the central retinal vessels, and also to describe the flow of aqueous humor, uh, which is uh, a main determinant of the intraocular pressure. Uh, then recently, uh, we have coupled this uh, systemic view of the eye with uh, 
a model of the circulation in the brain that was available in the literature and that in particular accounted for the circulation of blood, interstitial fluid and CSF in the brain, uh, as well as outside the ventricles. Uh, and we coupled it in order to obtain uh, the first systemic view of the coupling between the eye and the brain. And this is actually uh, the result uh, that was recently presented at the annual meeting of uh, the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology. And the model was used to uh, show um, how the, actually the venous collapsibility, uh, especially in the eye, might play an important role in the visual impairment that uh, uh, develops in some, but not all, astronauts in long space flights. And uh, so, okay, sorry. So let me move uh, quickly. Uh, uh, but I need to say what Christophe is telling me, but I cannot see it from the screen. Okay. Uh, this, I don't have time to go through the details. Uh, then uh, next, um, uh, the, the next box will be about the, um, the um, zooms of the special regions. Uh, you um, will hear from Christophe and Lorenzo uh, the work that, they have, that we have done together on the eye, uh, as Lorenzo presented it at the same meeting uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, Christophe will mention the work that has been done on the brain um, in Strasbourg, in particular within the Viva Brain project. And the goal will be then to connect these uh, um, uh, eye and brain uh, uh, zooms uh, uh, with the systemic view. For the moment, it has been done uh, for the eye. And then at the level of the lower scales, uh, we, have, we have been able to describe the role of bicarbonate uh, in the establishment of the IOP, as well as the role of glutamate and nitric oxide in functional hyperemia for the retina. Uh, and I without going into the details, but just to give you a grasp of how that is done, you can see here that basically we have the same circuit for the retina we have seen before. And so this is kind of the level, the systemic level of the blood flow that could be connected with the big circuit. But you see these little schematics here. Basically, it tends to say that the values of the resistances that are in this portion of the circuits are actually determined by the local um, uh, processes that are going on uh, in the astrocytes, smooth muscle cells, and the tidal layer that are uh, surrounding the uh, smaller, large arterioles. So this is that coupling between the systemic view and the local view of the cells. Uh, these I will skip because we don't have time, but if you're interested, I would be very happy to discuss them with you. Uh, then just a few conclusive remarks. Uh, indeed, the problem, the eye to brain project is pretty challenging uh, from the modeling viewpoint, as I discussed before. Um, and uh, um, also from the computational viewpoint, because when we need to account for real geometries and large scale data, well, also the simulations will be extremely costly. And here is where the expertise of Christoph and the group of Strasbourg becomes extremely important. Uh, as you might have understood, this is really an interdisciplinary effort because the modeling is not driven but by the techniques that we already know, but by trying to understand or to develop or to use the techniques that are needed to actually solve the problem we aim at, uh, meaning the connections between the eye and the brain in a quantitative way. Uh, this has actually led us uh, also to um, <laughs> new developments in mathematics and scientific computing, for example, uh, to investigate from a theoretical and applicative viewpoint the role of viscoelasticity when uh, dealing with porous materials. Uh, because indeed, when we want to study the perfusion of a tissue, for example, the lamina cribrosa in the eye, uh, our tissues are not only elastic, but also viscoelastic, and the Im relative importance of the viscous component with respect to the elastic one uh, makes a lot of difference in the response to the tissues to uh, drastic changes, for example, in intraocular pressure. So with here, with this, I lead to the last slide that basically we need to keep in mind what the overall goal is. Basically take images from the eye and uh, through a mathematical and computational platform that you want to develop, we want to use it to 
build a technique, a tool that can actually be used to, for example, estimate what we cannot measure directly, as probably Lorenz will discuss, to interpret the clinical data so that then actually what we see in the eye can be used as biomarkers for diseases of the eye, but also of the brain. And uh, in the slides that I had no time to show you, uh, we can also think of using such a platform to test and develop therapeutic approaches, both for the eye and uh, for the brain. With this, uh, I thank all the collaborators, uh, as Alon was also mentioning, without the interdisciplinary effort, this work could not be done and could not be possible. And um, I thank you all for your attention.